thank you so much for uh, for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of my own research, but also just sort of to represent my area of research uh, more generally, which is um, consumer psychology, and I'll, I'll sort of define that um, uh, in a second here. Uh, but the, the research that I do is really trying to understand um, consumption broadly. And so what we're talking about here, just to try to connect the dots, um, it, it was great actually going, going second for me, sort of seeing um, you know, what Josh had to say and, and about the specific context of CSFs and, and looking for the connections between that and what I see in sort of consumer psychology more broadly. And in consumer psychology, essentially what we're looking at is trying to understand the decisions that we make <clears throat> on a day-to-day -day basis about the wide variety of products that we consume. And some of these products are durables like cars, some of them are true consumables like toothpaste, and then everything in between like, you know, shoes, apparel, et cetera, fuel, housing. And th there are lots of things that we learn, and I'll share some of this today, that, that uh, a lot of findings that generalize across those different contexts, and other findings that I think will be <clears throat> specific and unique to specific contexts, including that of the CSFs. Um, so what I'll try to do today is share a little bit of my perspective, my research, and then you know a little bit more about what our field does, and um, invite you to sort of interpret it and see the connections with what you do, particularly from a public policy point of view. And I'll try to help make some of those connections as I as I go. So first of all, some definitions. When when I say sustainable consumption, what exactly? Um, do we mean by sustainable consumption? And, and this won't be new to this crowd, but um, I always sort of start off thinking about, you know, what is this term sustainability all about? And just, you know, the, the, the definition that people often refer to, you know, from the Brundtland Commission is essentially something sustainable if it perpetuates. If you can satisfy needs today, which is what consumption is really focused on, is satisfying needs or perceived needs without compromising the ability of future generations to do the same. All right. And so what about sustainable consumption? Well, the UN took a swipe at that one too, and essentially they said, well, sustainable consumption means that you're, you're consuming products and services in a way that sort of is sensitive to um, the, the use of resources and avoids pollution. But, but note here in particular, a real strong focus on environmental aspects. And I was really happy to see Josh sort of talk about the interdependence of economic, environmental, and social issues. And I think that the business community more broadly is maturing to have that, that perspective as well. But it's interesting to see how that's evolved over time. So what do we mean by sustainable consumption? And I apologize for the slide glitch here. I guess different, slightly different system. But essentially think about sustainable consumption as a process that we all go through to different degrees depending on the context of identifying a need, and it may be a true need, need for food, that's a real need, or it may be a perceived want, a desire, but essentially going through a process of recognizing that need, and then some sort of decision-making process. You can think about it as, you know, identifying the different options, figuring out what criteria you care about, coming up with a strategy for making a decision, and then ultimately making that decision, and then having the experience of having, you know, purchased a product or consumed a good. And increasingly, when we talk about sustainable consumption, again, we're looking at the interdependence of these three issues. And that's where I think this gets really interesting, is trying to not just sort of say, OK, we need to protect the environment, because we do, obviously, but we also need to balance all of these different needs. And doing that is a real challenge, certainly at the policy level, but certainly for consumers um, when they are buying products. Because when you think about it, we, we purchase products really to satisfy other consumption needs not to satisfy sustainability needs. In fact, the most sustainable thing to do is to consume less, right? Um, so what we're talking about here is when you do need to consume, how to consume better. Um, that's essentially what a lot of people focused on, in, in, including uh, me and my own research. So first of all, um, you know, why do we even care about this? And, and I'll just make this brief because most people sort of get this intuitively, but essentially when you look at our consumption levels, particularly in the U.S., they're simply not sustainable. Right, so global population recently hit 7 billion on its way not too long to 9 billion. <clears throat> and if everyone consumed at the level that we consume at today in the U.S., we would need <clears throat> five Earths. Right? And so you know, as the world's different economies develop and, and people in those economies consume more, clearly we have a situation here that's just, it's, um, it's just not tenable, it's not sustainable. All right. So do people intuitively get this? And the answer is yes, but 
there's a huge gap between sort of people getting it and understanding that they they should care about these issues and even believing that they do things on a daily basis to to reflect those concerns those values but there's just as much research saying that really there's a huge huge gap between what people say and what they do and so my research and that of many others in, in my area is really trying to focus on what are the different reasons uh, uh, for this gap what accounts for this gap and there's some obvious ones that will just sort of put out there just to take them off the table because they're, they're there and they're real but they can be addressed over time through sort of you know typical market mechanisms so price premiums you could think of sort of sustainable products as products that are relatively new to the market oftentimes you don't have the cost efficiencies as products that have been out in the market for a long time so price premiums and lack of availability so the question is what else might account for this gap between attitudes um, and behaviors. So, so what I'm going to do over the next couple minutes is drill down and share just some of my own specific research and, and then I'll step back and, and share some findings um, from my field that, that more broadly I think give you a sense of how we how we sort of look at this problem. So first of all just to set it up you know given a choice between these two shoes and imagine that the one on on your left is is promoted as a more sustainable shoe. All right, so given a choice between these two shoes which one would you pick and why? There are a lot of different factors that are going to influence this, right? So for example, you know, the difference in the aesthetic is going to probably influence you, the brand, differences in pricing, and so forth. In this one project I want to share with you, the, the first thing that we wanted to understand was just this concept of sustainability. What associations do people have with this concept of sustainability, and how might that affect consumption? So if nothing else, if I had two shoes that looked identical and said, this one is more sustainable than that one, which one would you pick and why? All right. So in this one project, one of the things that we did, and I, I won't go through all the details, and I'll, I'll share a more specific example in a second here, but essentially what we're looking at is what we refer to as response latencies. To understand the associations, the words that people associate with sustainability, you go through a series of tests where you pair words and see how quickly people can match up these different pairs. In essence, what we found is that when I say sustainability, to the average consumer, this, this all of a sudden evokes a lot of associations that are very positive. Sustainable means healthy, gentle, safe. Those are good things. On the other hand, sustainable also means not strong, not durable, not long-lasting. So these are just automatic associations. And you could get into sort of, well, how did these associations come to be? And that would be an interesting question. We were really just understanding and interested in understanding what those associations were. And so you can imagine that in some product categories, if you are trying to sell sustainable uh, or uh, sustainable baby shampoo, well, with baby shampoo, you really want it to be safe and gentle. And so a sustainable baby shampoo actually could be perceived as a better product than the alternative. So that, that would be a good thing. On the other hand, if you're selling products that really depend on the associations of strength and durability and toughness and so forth and things that we studied in some of our experiments were tires and garbage bags and detergent sustainability can be a real liability now it's interesting going back in the CSF context thinking about sort of the benefits of buying sustainably in terms of community building good for the environment social benefits etc there's a really good alignment there but in many product categories, it's a bit of a force fit. And in fact, sustainability is, is a bit of a hurdle initially, you know, circa 2011 for people to overcome. And so understanding ways to overcome that is one of the things, too, um, that, that, that we're focused on trying to understand. Just to sort of explain how powerful this intuition can be and how it can infect, uh, affect choice. Um, if you think back a little bit, it was about a couple years ago, this, this um, concern about swine flu they hit the country. We thought, well, this would be an interesting way to sort of demonstrate that this intuition has real impact on choices, choices that matter. So people, this was at the University of Texas where I did my PhD, and everyone on campus was very concerned about swine flu, and, and the dean had sent out a message to everyone saying, make sure you keep your hands clean, do what you can, be safe, etc. So we set up a table, and we gave people a choice of two different um, hand cleaners. And one was promoted as being a more sustainable alternative. The other was sort of the mainstream conventional uh, product. That was the only difference between the two. And we wanted to let people sort of choose, right? 
So we did this in two different ways. In one situation, we had what we call in psychology confederate. We had a graduate student standing there with a clipboard, keeping track of the choice that you made. That was one condition. In another condition, we had our confederate way back in the background, not visible, not really part of the whole setup, just tracking what people did on their own. And it turns out that it really matters. And, and I think this sort of illustrates a couple things about consumer behavior, at least in this context. If you look at the graph on the left, what you see is when the confederate is nearby, when other people are watching us, whether it's our neighbors, our friends, our family, we will pick the sustainable product because that's the right thing to do. And other people are holding us accountable. However, if you look at the graph on the right, when nobody's watching us and we get to choose the one that's better for us, their intuition, at least in this product category, was that the non-sustainable one is going to be more effective. Right? And even the people who did pick the more sustainable one, the green cleaner, they used twice as much of it. So even those people were compensating for the lack of efficacy. It just shows you how strong the intuition is that sustainable in some categories is a liability. So what can we do about that? In another set of studies, what we did was sort of say, okay, well, we make trade-offs in, in our decisions all the time. Let's just make these trade-offs explicit and say, well, let's say you've got two products. One is a better performing product. One is a more sustainable product. And we treated sustainability sort of generically as pro-environmental, pro-social. -so pro and we wanted to understand what choices people made, but also what those choices depended on and it's specifically the emotions underlying those choices. Because if you can start to understand the emotions, then maybe you can start to influence those decisions in, in a proactive way. And here quickly is what we found. Essentially what we found is that, and I'll just sort of explain it, um, the, the graph might help a little bit. Essentially what we found is that products have to meet a minimum threshold of performance. Don't, they don't need to be the best products out there, but think about, for example, some of the earliest green products were detergents. Right? And a lot of these products were not promoted to really work well. They were promoted to be sustainable. And that's a mistake. If you're going to promote these products, you have to first reassure people that they work well. They don't have to be the best, but they have to be good enough. And what we found here was really what we call the threshold effect, that until you meet a minimum level of functional performance, people aren't really going to consider your sustainable product. Okay? The, the other thing that we found was in terms of the underlying emotions, it depends a lot on whether you care about these issues. There's great variability in the degree to which people care about these issues. Um, but if you do care about these issues, there are a couple different emotions we were looking at. One was guilt, you know, choosing the wrong thing. Does that motivate you to do the right thing? The other one was confidence. And what we found, interestingly, was that both of those emotions mattered. What really, really drove the decision here was confidence. And what we found was that people who really believed that sustainability is important didn't feel what I call the confidence deficit towards the sustainable product. There was no lack of confidence in that product. On the other hand, people that are sort of, they care about these issues, but maybe not as much, they're not going to make sort of a, a moral stand on it. They're simply just not as confident in these products. And so the question then becomes, well, how can you make people feel more confident in products when there is an explicit trade-off? And in some product categories, uh, there will be. And I won't take you through all the details of this experiment, but basically what we, what we showed with this experiment, I'll just focus on this slide here, was that we used a different product category, in this case cell phones, and we showed that if you take a product that has an explicit functional performance deficit, you can compensate for that by giving it um, an explicit aesthetic design advantage. Simply put, what it means is if you are in the business of developing so-called sustainable products, you better be very good at product design as well, because that is a terrific way to address that need for confidence, to make people feel better about a product. And so when you see a lot of sustainable products out there that look sort of extreme and what we call in psychology non-normative, that can be a big mistake, because really what you want to do is get people increasingly to see these products as the new normal, I'll sort of co-opt that term, but the new normal being the sustainable product, that means embracing sort of leading edge and current trends in, in aesthetic design. All right, so that was one um, specific example, and I've got some other projects that I'm working on, looking at aesthetics and personality and energy usage, et cetera. But, but what I thought I would do is take a few minutes to share with you some of the different areas of research in consumer psychology within the context of sustainability.